Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you, whether you are here in the sanctuary, whether you're joining us online or on the radio through KTCU. We want you to know that wherever you are, uh, that you are welcome here, and it is good for us to be together as the people of God. So we are in the midst of a summer sermon series that we're calling Under Construction. Uh, right now, as you know, our building is being renovated. Uh, our building is under construction, and so I thought it might be fun for us to look uh, for a few weeks about what it might be like to build the life that we want. We are all of us, I would say, under construction, a work in progress. When I first started dating my wife, Kelly, she reminded me that I was a bit of a fixer-upper. And she reminds me to this day that there's still some work that needs to be done. Last week, we talked about the importance of building our lives upon a spiritual foundation. And this morning, we're going to look at what we might refer to as the second pillar of building a life that we want, and that is meaningful work. The texts that we're going to be looking at this morning are very brief. There are two, but they are both short. Uh, they both come from the Apostle Paul, who, as you will hear, encourages us to cultivate an attitude in our work that glorifies and honors God. So I invite you to hear this word now from the Apostle Paul. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, and Colossians 3, Verse 23 through 24. Here begins the reading. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always bounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So have you ever noticed that when you meet somebody, perhaps for the first time and you're getting to know them a little bit, you're engaged in a little bit of small talk, that inevitably one of the first questions that you will probably ask is, so what do you do? It may be small talk, but it's not a small question. I would argue that in some ways, it's a question of identity. It's a question of meaning. It's a question of purpose. You see, we spend right around a third of our lives working. And I would argue that, that just about every single one of us has this innate desire to find meaning in our work. It's embedded in our DNA. It's deep in the marrow of our bones. Whether you have a, a corner office, whether you are waiting tables, punching the clock, or are engaged in the exceedingly important work of raising children at home, all of us have within us this innate desire to find meaning in our work. And yet, according to the Harvard Business Review, who did a survey of over 12,000 employees in a number of different careers and companies all over the world, they discovered that about 50% of us lack a level of meaning and significance at work. Work at its best, according to the poet Galil Gibran, is love made visible. Our work is love made visible, and we all know that, that engaging in our work with a, with a whole heart is one of the best ways to enjoy, to fully live our lives, to find satisfaction in our accomplishments, to see meaning in everything that we do, in all of our efforts. And that's the good news. It's also the bad news. Because when your work life is filled with drudgery, it's bereft of love, meaning a level of satisfaction that can make life so difficult. Many of you know that there is no joy in dragging yourself out of bed in the morning to go to a job that you hate, where you feel helpless or bored or unappreciated. 
And there have been hundreds of studies that have been conducted that show that there is a, a close link between job satisfaction and life satisfaction, that those two things are deeply connected. You see, our, our work has a, a tremendous impact on us internally, emotionally, and I would argue spiritually as well. Bill Shore used to work in politics. He served as the chief of staff for a number of different U.S. senators. But now he's no longer involved in politics, at least in that way, and he now runs an organization called Share Our Strength, an effort to end childhood hunger in the United States. He's also written a book called The Cathedral Within. And in it, he says this, he says it's a, it's a basic need like water or calcium for our lives to have a lasting impact, that that in part is what makes us feel whole. What we sense is that this desire that we have for our lives to have meaning and purpose, it's, it's what makes us feel that our lives count. Now, the title of that book, The Cathedral Within, comes from what he gained as he traveled all throughout Europe, visiting a number of different beautiful cathedrals, all of them, all of them beautiful. And as he did, as he did, as he traveled about, he, he thought of the builders that built those beautiful cathedrals and was amazed at their inspiration and their faith. You see, you see, oftentimes it would take sometimes 100, 200, maybe even 300 years to build a cathedral in that time. And yet, and yet all of those people that helped to build it, many of them would never see it finished. I would argue, I would argue that one of the reasons that the church universal, that the big C church struggles today is because we have failed to connect the dots between our work and our faith, that we don't do a very good job of talking and thinking about our work from a Christian point of view, that we're, we don't ask ourselves what our faith has to say about, about how we earn our living, about what our work really means. Sadly, I'm afraid that we have lost sight of our concept of vocation as a theological concept. We've lost sight of the realization that, that we are all of us, all of us called by God, that we all have been given. We've all been given a purpose in this life, and we've lost sight of what that vocation may be. A few years ago, there was some research that was done around this notion of Christian vocation, and they asked young pastors, young preachers who had just graduated from seminary, and one of them, uh, just about all of them, said that vocation was a significant and a regular theme in their preaching and in their teaching. But the other side of that research showed, however, that there was this overwhelming majority of the people that sat in those pews that were part of those congregations that felt that, that they didn't feel called that there was no call placed upon their life. They felt that, that what they did outside of the church didn't seem worthy of God's attention, that there was a disconnect between their career and any sense of calling. Years ago, when I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to study under William Sloan Coffin. He was a visiting professor at the seminary I attended. He had just wrapped up his ministry at the Riverside Church in New York City. And one day, he talked about the difference between a career and a calling. A career, he said, seeks to be successful, whereas a calling seeks to be valuable. A career seeks to make money. A calling seeks to make a difference. He pointed out, he pointed out that the word career comes from the same Latin root as car. The word is carrera, which means, quite literally, racetrack. Now, when we think of a racetrack, what do we think of? We think of contra up images of, of going in circles quite fast with a level of competition. A car, a car is driven. It frees us from having to travel with other people. But a calling, however, comes from the Latin root vocare, which means quite literally to call. Coffin said this, he said, a career is a skill that you learn that helps you get from here to there. 
But a calling helps you, requires you to question, to listen deeply in order to discover whether there is worth going to at all. He said a career helps you win the rat race. But a calling reminds you that even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. (laughs) Years ago, when I was a student across the street at TCU, there was a sign in the career center that simply said, the hell with your career. What's your calling? Several years ago, I heard Mike Iaconelli challenge a large group of high school students to discover what it is that they were called to do in life. He said, he said, when you and I are called, and we're all called, it's the most important thing in our life. He said that, that we're all called to do something, and, and when we do it, when we live out that calling, we can, we can feel God's pleasure in that moment. He went on to say that this is what the Christian faith is at its core. It's God capturing your heart, discovering what it is that God wants you to do, and then doing it. Perhaps grace becomes the courage that allows us to say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Some of you are thinking, yeah, that's great, Russ. You're a little late on this sermon. I wish I would have heard this when I was a child, still trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grow up. I think a lot of us are still trying to figure out what we want to be when we grow up, regardless of our age. Many of you know the story of Alfred Nobel, a Swedish chemist who who made a fortune by inventing powerful explosives. In a sense, he discovered and invented dynamite. And then what he would do is he would license that formula to governments all over the world in order to build weapons. Well, one day, Alfred's brother died, strangely, perhaps ironically enough, in an explosion in the family lab. But the local paper at that point, by accident, printed an obituary for Alfred instead of the brother that died. And it identified him as the inventor of dynamite who who became quite wealthy by enabling armies to achieve new levels of mass destruction. You see, Nobel had this unique opportunity to read his own obituary while he was still alive, to see what he was going to be remembered for, and he was shocked to think that this is what his life would add up to, to be remembered as as a merchant of death and destruction. Well, realizing that it's never too late to change, he took his fortune and decided to establish awards for accomplishment that contribute towards life and not death. And we call those Nobel Prizes, and they are given each year to individuals who succeed and excel in peace, human achievement. And today, that... That is how he is remembered, not for explosives. You see, Nobel realized that he had more to offer this world than than what he did for a living, how he made his living. Instead, he started asking the question, what do I have to offer this world? You see, I would ask, I would argue that whenever we ask that question, we are simply asking, who am I? And we must never forget that when we ask that question, The answer always begins with God, that I can't ask ultimately who I am without realizing first whose I am. Now, I'm willing to bet that we all have moments, we all have seasons when we realize that the life that we are living is not the life that we want to live in us. But in those moments, in those moments, if we're careful, we can catch a glimpse. If we pay attention, we can catch a glimpse of the real life, the the life that we have been called by God to live. So may we, like Nobel, come to realize that it's never too late to be who God called us to be. You know, our vocation, our vocation, our calling from God may not necessarily be just our work, but but how we do our work. Do we, as people of faith, live out our core values? 
Does our work represent a, a Christian ethic in what we do? Do we, in all our work, do everything that we can to build up those around us? Or are we constantly stepping on fingers and toes as we climb the ladder of success? Is our love made visible in the work that we do, in the way that we make our living? You know, one of the most important books that I've ever read, one that impacted and shaped me more perhaps than any other is Parker Palmer's book, Let Your Life Speak. Let Your Life Speak is, a, is an old Quaker saying that means quite literally, let the highest truths and values guide you and live up to those demanding standards in everything that you do. There's another issue here that needs to be addressed Actually, it's a warning, and I offer it because we all know people who have made their work, made their career into an idol. Tim Keller, who was a very famous preacher and pastor in New York City, he died recently. He wrote a book called Every Good Endeavor in which he said, work is not all there is to life that you will not have a meaningful life without work, but you cannot say that your work is the meaning of your life. That if you make work the purpose of your life, you create an idol that rivals God. Your relationship with God is the most important foundation of your life, and indeed, it keeps all the other factors, work, friendship, family, leisure, pleasure, all of those things from becoming so important that they become addicting and distorted. I think what he's saying is that your work will not provide you the meaning that you need until you find your meaning in the one who gives you that work. That when you discover your identity, when you discover your purpose in and through God, that God's desires for your life will become your desires. That you will experience a blessing and a joy and a fulfillment that only God can provide. Isn't that what, what Paul was saying a moment ago? Be steadfast, be movable, always excelling in the work of God because you know that in God your labor is not in vain. So work as if your soul depends on it and work for God and not just for other humans. You know, last summer I had the opportunity to travel with our Youth Handbell Choir on the Youth Handbell England Tour. There was about 20 of us. Todd was the leader of this. I just came along to carry the bells, basically, was my job. I, I was sort of the groupie, the roadie, I guess you could say, of the group. But one of the things that we did is we, we studied and, and traveled around to a number of different places, and one of the places that we visited was St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Now, if you've ever visited St. Paul's Cathedral, you know that it is one of the most beautiful cathedrals in all the world. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in all the world. And there on that day, as we toured around, after we were done, I gathered the group together and I told them this story. The story goes that Christopher Wren, who was the designer, the architect of that beautiful cathedral, was very active in the building was there all throughout its construction, and, and he had this habit of going around and asking people, so what is it that you were doing? And a lot of them would simply respond and tell them their trade. Well, I, I'm, I'm laying bricks. I, I'm painting frescoes. I'm, I'm carrying stones. Well, one day, one day, deep beneath the sanctuary, back in one of the crypts, he came across this Simple woman, sweeping with a simple broom, sweeping up the dust. Excuse me, ma'am, he said. What are you doing? And when, when he asked her that question, she stopped. And her eyes got big and a smile grew upon her face. And she said, oh, oh, I am building a beautiful and majestic cathedral for a beautiful and majestic God. So what do you do? Small talk, but it's a big question. 
I suppose the biggest question is, are you just laying bricks or are you building cathedrals? Amen.